Good evening. This lecture, Bezrat Hashem, will be Lilui Nishmat Shai Liael Bat Moran, Daniel Ben Natan, Roda Bat Natan, Arthur Ben Avram Avinu, Lerfuat, David Ben Helena, Esther Bat Naomi, Ruven Ben Sara, and also Sylvia Capodilopo, Shakadosh Baruch Hu Igal Otam Yisurea, Refua Shlema. ‫אולי הוא נשמע את שלמה חיים בן יעקב, ‫אין חיה שרה בת ישעיה. ‫פיו אנאונסמנט בפור אי סטארט, ‫אתם יודעים עכשיו שאנחנו יכולים להיות ‫בביאות על רמבל, ‫לא רק ביוטיוב. ‫אנחנו יש רמבל, ‫זה יותר רפובליקן, ‫לא ליברל. ‫יוטיוב תמיד מתחילת אתכם ‫שאתם אומרים דברים ‫שאתם לא אוהבים. Or oh, they threaten us that they're going to take off the channel. You know how it is. That's why we had to, to make another alternative channel. It's Rumble. Please join it. It grew pretty fast, Baruch Hashem. Even I didn't make an announcement. But now I'm making an announcement. Everybody that is on the YouTube page, please go on the Rumble. Why? One day it's just going to disappear. So you want to be able to be connected as a backup, okay? And one more thing, uh, I still have some CDs. CD number one, Pat to the Just and Pirkei Avot. Those three CDs, you can get them now for free. As many as you want, you just have to pay the shipping, whatever. You can send the label or, or we can do the shipping for you, whatever it's going to cost. But you can get, you can also come to the lectures and pick them up. If you email me in advance that you want to put them out, and uh, Monday you can pick them up on Queens in the lecture in Fresh Meadows, or you can pick them up here on Tuesday, but uh, with a notice in advance, tell me how many you want, we'll bring you a box, you can give them out. Before, in a few months, there's not going to be any more CDs, you know, we might as well use the leftover and get them out there. One other uh, interesting thing before I start the lecture, I, w I had a very interesting device installed in my house a few days ago. It's called Amnon 18. Did you hear about it? Amnon 18. This is a genius device. This is a genius device that allows you to use in a kosher way allow you to use hot water on Shabbos. Don't get confused. There is a decree that you're not allowed to take a shower with hot water. Even if it's water that was hidden before Shabbos or by the sun, you're not allowed to take full body shower with hot water. But some hot water you can use to wash your hands, to wash dishes, to wash the baby. I don't have to tell you how freezing the water here when it's zero degrees or below zero. So this is an unbelievable device. Unbelievable device. What does it do? It's interesting how it works. It controls the temperature of the boiler that the water will never reach the temperature what we call in Alacha Yat Soledet Bo. It's never going to get to 45 degrees or, for, or 43 degrees. It has an app and it goes according to all the shitot. Ashkenazim, Hasidim, <laughs> this shita, Shulchan Aruch, the Ramah, all the shitot. When they install it, they ask you. You go on Shabbos by Rabbeinu Tam, you go regular. They set up the whole system. It's an unbelievable thing. And a minute or two minutes before sunset, it goes into the Shabbos mode. Once you go into the Shabbos mode, the water, the, the hot water in the faucet will not go over 41 or 43 degrees Celsius. So I think it's about 105, 110 Fahrenheit. Right when Shabbos is finished, a minute after, it goes out of Shabbos mode into regular mode. What's the difference? In regular mode, the water are boiling. It can burn your body. Go to the hospital. On the Shabbos mode, you never get burned. Why? Because it's 41, 43. It's very, it's hot, but not burning. 
Yeah, so you can, uh, so, okay, so now when you say you can shower on Shabbat, you, you have to understand. Ashkenazim, they machmir. They don't sh- take showers even with cold water. Even though it's lechatchila allowed, there's no problem. They worry about schita. They think that maybe you will uh, squeeze the hair or I don't know, the towel maybe. The Sfaradim don't have this problem. Sfaradim can take a shower with cold water even without this device. Cold water, complete cold water. And now you have the option of taking a, a shower with lukewarm water, not hot water, but not cold, meaning it breaks the coldness of the water. You're not freezing and shaking for 15 minutes. That's an interesting thing. Now you may wonder, wait, wait a minute, okay, everything sounds beautiful. Oh, one more thing. It also pick randomly when the boilers will turn on. It does, not get, it does not turn on when cold water goes in, like regular boilers, because that's cooking. And that's psikresha. If you know every time you take a shower, for sure cold water will go in, and they'll get cooked. Indirectly, in grama, you're creating cooking. It's, you're not really cooking with your hands. But it's obvious that it's going to happen. It's not permitted. But here, it's programmed that it will not turn on automatically. It would pick up his own time. Nothing to do with your action. He can uh, turn anytime he wants. There's a system over there. This obviously was checked by big rabbis. And there is a... There is a... There is in Israel, it's called Machon Tzomit. You know Machon Tzomit? This is an orthodox a organization, and they are specialists in checking devices if they're kosher or not. Like for handicaps, for regular people, what's kosher for Shabbos and not? So they got a letter, we authorized that we checked the system that device hot water on Shabbat, Amnon 18, and we found that it's kosher to be used for Shabbos and holidays. And they give now all the instruction why it's kosher. Right? And it's, uh, it's uh, unbelievably, you know, that's of Israel Rosen, the, the head engineer that checked it and knows all the halachot. And of course, they have big, also Rabbi Weiss, the Avbedin of Montreal, himself authorized it. And uh, there's Baruch Hashem really no, no fear whatsoever to have a Chilul Shabbat. Right now many people are Mechalel Shabbos because they cannot handle, they cannot handle the, the coldness of the water when they have a baby. Some people are weak. They don't want to see the baby suffering. So they just turn the hot water on on Shabbos. What happened when the hot water goes out, cold water goes instead. And then the, the boiler goes on, and they mechshal in Chilul Shabbat. Many, many people. Actually, the guy that installed it by me told me, I have no idea how many people that when I spoke to them, I realized from the conversation that systematically there were mechal Shabbos almost every Shabbos. Why? They couldn't resist the nisayon, you know, it's not easy. Now, Baruch Hashem, there is a solution, you know, for a price of one pair of tefillin. You can have hot water forever. Every Shabbos, in Yom Tov, no problem whatsoever. Baruch Hashem, it's unbelievable. I got very excited when, when I saw how brilliant the invention was, how everything was taken into consideration. Baruch Hashem, unbelievable. So, that's not our topic here tonight. I just was so excited, I wanted to talk about it, and I kept forgetting. So, Baruch Hashem. Talk. We now, between Parashat Naso, the longest parasha in the Torah, and Parashat Be'alotcha. In Eretz Israel, they're one week ahead of us. But we are here, in exile. And in case you forgot, we are one week behind the Israelis, because by Pesach, we had two days Yom Tov. So second Yom Tov fell on Shabbat. And we had to read the reading of Passover. When you read the reading of Passover, you don't have uh, room to read the reading of the week. 
So it gets postponed to the following Shabbat. But in Israel, they don't have two days Yom Tov. The, the Yom Tov in Israel is only one day. So therefore, on the second day of Pesach here, it was a weekday in Israel. Shabbat. Regular Shabbat, not Yom Tov. So, uh, as results of that, they actually read the parasha. Tov. In our parasha, there are three major things that we read on Shabbat. It's important, I didn't have time yesterday to speak about it, that's why I want to start with that. Three subjects. Donations to the Kohanim, to the Kohen, Truma la Kohen, Isha Sota, a woman that cheated, and the third is a Nazir. I know in English Nazir it's monk, but that's really not what it means. How do you say Nazir in English? Nazir? Nazareth? Nazareth means Nazir? Wow. They actually took the original word. And there is a connection between those three topics, and that's why they're one next to, to each other in the Torah. When two subjects are next to each other, that means there is some kind of connection between them. So the Chachamim in the Gemara, they told us that someone who does not give the 10%, the Maaser, to the Kohen, meaning in the old days they had to go and bring the wheat, the barley, whatever came out from the field, they had to give it to the Kohen. If someone is holding it in his house, he's not rushing to go and give it to the Kohen, it means I'm going to give it, but I don't have time for it right now. So it's, for now it's in his storage. Because he's not giving it to the Kohen quickly, Hashem is going to give him a horrible punishment. He's going to have to be forced to go to the Kohen. Why? Because his wife will start behaving in a not proper way and starting to talk to a stranger, to another man. And he will warn her not to be isolated with that person. And she would do it anyway, after the warning. And now he begins to suspect that she's actually cheating on him. So the only way to clear that doubt is to take her to the Kohen. And the Kohen will have to write the, the name of Hashem, which is Hashem uh, HaMeforash, 72 different letters. They write it. And once they put it inside the water, they also take water, sand from the floor of the Beta Mikdash. Three ingredients in the water. Water, spring water, natural water, sand from the ground of the holy temple, and the ink that you write the name of God on a cloth, like a mezuzah, you write the name, you put it inside the cup, the ink dissolved and go inside to the water with the, with the sand, and she has to drink it. And now there's one of the biggest miracles of those days. If she cheated, her wound explodes, and she died in a horrible way, very, very frightening way. If she did not cheat, obviously she's not going to die. And because she was a kind of humiliated, now the Kohen is going to give her a blessing for, for having good kids or to have a child if she doesn't have. Machloket in Gemara, Rabbi Ishmael and Rabbi Akiva. If the, she doesn't have any kids, the Kohen will give her a decree that she's going to have a child. If she has kids, Rabbi Akiva say, what do you do if she already has kids? What does she need? She has 10 kids already. She's not anxious to have more. What blessing he can give someone like that? A woman that five years married and never had kids, if she now went to the Kohen, at least something good came out of it for her. She got the embarrassment, but she got a blessing to have a child and this blessing going through. But what happened if she already has 10 kids? How she's going to get compensated for the humiliation that she had. Rabbi Akiva say, if she have short kids, meaning very short, that she's gonna have a long one, mm -hmm. meaning tall. If she has an ugly one, she's gonna get a pretty one. If she has sick one, she's gonna get a healthy one. Meaning, whatever the problem was, Rabbi Akiva bring a list of things. So, now we're going to talk about it in a minute when it comes to Hannah, the mother of Shmuel, the prophet, and the trick she wanted to do to Hashem. 
for, to force him to give her a child. A brilliant trick. I have some problems with that. We have to analyze those problems. How Hannah, the holy Hannah, the mother of the holiest prophet, Shmuel, how she even dared to think such thing. We have to understand what's the secret behind that story. But remember, so now he has to get the wife to the Kohen. And the Gemara also says someone that sees a woman that she is a suspect of being a cheater. Nobody know yet until she's going to go to the temple. As of now, she's only a suspect. I don't have to tell you that in this world, if you are a suspect, people already rush to judge you. And if in the end you, you are found innocent, nobody even remember that, that you found innocent. You know how the newspaper, they put you on the front uh, page that you are suspect in this and this and this and that. Everybody runs away from you. Your children are finished. Your family reputation is ruined. Your business is done. You get a heart attack, you die from pain, and six to eight months later, you're going to find a little box in the newspaper in the back page. The police, the court found Mr. X innocent. No proof was any sufficient, and they had to release him. But by now, his life is over. Even Jewish, there's no, Jewish newspapers are all mass murderers, all of them. There is no difference between them and the secular newspapers. All the magazines that call themselves all kinds of names, bombastic, holy names, the, the connection between them and holiness does not exist. They take people, they publish them, they get their news from the secular site, and they publish the same news that they get from the secular site, they put it in their newspapers, in their magazine, and they have no problem saying that Mr. X or Mr. Y is a suspect, and the FBI arrested him, or the police arrested him, and the police uh, uh, submitted a claim against him, which is against the law. It's against the Torah. You're not allowed to write any Lashon Ara about a person, even when he's 100% true. Who told you that you're allowed to publish it to the whole world? Now you have uh, 30,000 people that knows him, and he has a lot of close friends and business colleagues. As soon as they see the article on the religious magazine, nobody wants anything to do with him. Nobody wants to marry his children. Everyone is worried. You already judged him. You destroyed him. You destroyed his life. And then he wasn't even found guilty. And even if he will be found guilty, in a secular American court or secular Israeli court, that means nothing. This court is not reliable to judge people according to God's rules. So even if the American court would find him guilty in a murder, you're not allowed to believe. And if they found him guilty in any crime, there it's, it's not a fair trial. Why? Because the, the witnesses are cooperating with the police to save their own skin. They do plea bargain. Someone who was a partner to the crime, the police said to him, you're going to uh, testify against him, we would let you go. And he's going to say anything the police want. So this whole trial is not honest. Plus the people are mechalelei Shabbat. So they don't care about their own life. When God said that mechalel Shabbat gets a cruel death by stoning and lose its share to the world to come by getting cut, so he doesn't wor he's not worried about his own life. You think he cares about someone innocent to send him to prison? So we cannot rely. And the judges are all mechalelei Shabbat. This judge is gay. This judge is mechalel Shabbat. This judge is pedophile. None of them are God-fearing people. So the trial to begin with means nothing. And anyone who believes secular court, the indictment or judgment or anything like that is a wicked person because you're not allowed to believe a word of what they say not the lawyers not the prosecutors not the judges they are all considered wicked according to halakha you're not allowed to put mezuzah in a secular court some liberal modern rabbis they go to secular court in israel when they build a new building and they put a mezuzah in the main door who gave you permission you're not allowed to put mezuzah over there would you put a mezuzah in a prostitution home? 
there is a, a, a place with, with all worst crimes you can think of. You're going to put mezuzah over there? Would you put mezuzah in a place that sell pork to Jews and open on Shabbat? You put mezuzah in a place like this? It's an embarrassment to do such thing. So, uh, it's, <laughs> it's, not, it's, a, it's not simple at all. I told you many times in the past, a kosher Jew is not allowed to step into a secular court. Sometimes you are forced to arrive. The police call you, and if you don't come, they will arrest you. Okay. You are news. You have to come. Sometimes they blame you for something. You have to come and defend yourself from their evil hands. But if you sue another Jew in a secular court, you're going to have a very serious problem. Very serious. And it's called Moiser. It cannot be counted as a part of the Minyan. If you say Kaddish, no one is allowed to answer Amen. No one is allowed to marry your children. No one is allowed to accept them to Yeshivot. No one is allowed to do business with you. No one is allowed to stand around you in a radius of six feet. You are completely banned from anyone. That's called Moiser. And you lost your share to the world to come. Did you ever hear more sanctions than this? Even Mechalel Shabbat has many, many sanctions against him, but it doesn't say you're not allowed to stand uh, in a radius of uh, six feet around him. Arba Amot, Mimeno. Actually, it's less than six feet. Arba Amot, two Amot is one, yeah, six feet. Six feet. Yes. Mechalel Shabbat, you're not allowed to let him be Chazan, you're not allowed to count him in a Minyan, you're not allowed to give him Aliyah. Some say if you say Kaddish, you're not allowed to answer Amen. Yeah, there's a lot of similar restrictions. However, it doesn't say that uh, you're not allowed to marry his children if he has a righteous child. His father is Mechalel Shabbat, but the child is righteous. There's no restriction of marrying. But if the father is Moiser, Moiser end of the world for the entire family. So that's why we're going to be very, very careful. Very, very... The Ashkenazim say Moiser, the Sfaradim say Moser. Moser, you say? The Hasidim say Moser. It's all the same lady with a different dress, you know? One day she wear blue, one day black, one day brown. Same lady. Same word, in different accents. Tov. So now, the Gemara says, if you see a woman, a Jewish woman, that's speaking to another man that is not her husband, it cannot be. Why? Because oh, back then, today unfortunately cannot say it anymore, unfortunately, we have to cry for it. But back then, 3,300 years ago, it's not possible that a Jewish woman will speak to someone that is not her husband. Not possible. Why? They're all extremely holy and modest. That's the way it was. Chazaka, not Israel, completely kosher. So how, how do you have such a restriction in the Torah? How do you have such a law? If, all, if everyone kosher, why do you need to give a warning? The answer is, they're all kosher until they drink wine. Once a woman drinks one or two glasses of wine, it, it can happen to men as well. But by ladies, it affects them very much. One or two or three glasses of wine, and the lady completely loses who she is. Not madness, not anything. She is a shemirachem, what she can do. That's why the Torah say, the Chachamim writes in the Gemara, Aroe isha sota bekilkula, yazir atzmo min ayayin. Stay away from wine. Why? Look what he did to this woman. What happened if you didn't see that she drank wine? She drank wine in her house, and she went out and she speak to the construction worker. Too much, bringing him tea, cookies, hi, how are you? Ah, you know, how a nice day. The husband warned her, and the next day again. And now, and she even went to the car with him, to the van. She's sitting with him for 10 minutes in the van. Look terrible and very ugly. The husband already warned her not to do it, and now he found her there. You didn't see that she drank wine. You already know for sure she drank wine. Why? Like I said, Back then, you couldn't find a woman who would dare to do such thing. I want to remind you 
that 900 years ago, Rashi, the greatest, biggest commentator on the entire Torah and Talmud in any Jewish literature, Rashi, of Shlomo Yitzchaki in France, 900 years ago, writes that the French women, Goyot, not Jews, I want to remind you that the number one place of lack of modesty in a history is France. That's the place of all the sexual crimes. Even the language is designed in such a way that it immediately attracts all kinds of sins. And the wine over there is the best and everything there is around that scene. And the perfumes and whatever and the fashion all comes from there. And although that they are known as the worst when it comes to modesty, I don't know today if they're still the worst, but back then they were the worst. Rashi testified that all the French girls 900 years ago were all virgins. Not one of them would dare to arrive to the night of her wedding when she was fully with another man. Rashi writes that they do everything else, but they will never dare to show up, meaning with the proof that she was already with someone else. As long as she wasn't fully with someone else, she can always lie and deny. Once she was fully with someone else, she cannot deny it anymore. That's it. The husband will know it. By Arabs, is even today, by most of them, is still like this today. Or in Iran, or in some other countries. If a woman will arrive to the night of her wedding, and her husband will find out that she was with somebody else before him, that will be the end of it. Probably the end of her life also. Why? Who's going to kill her? Her own father and brother. It's called Retzach al Kvod Mishpacha. Hundreds of Arab girls were murdered in Israel by their own father and brother, and the police do nothing about it. The Israeli police, they don't dare to go into the Arab territories and conduct an investigation. It's too risky. They let them do whatever they want. It's the Wild West. It's not only the Israeli police, it's also the French police. There is the Muslim quarter of Paris. After 9 p.m., no police enter. Doesn't matter if you get murdered, someone who is trying to murder you, you call 911 there, the police do not come. Few times they went and they had jeeps with bars, protected with bars, like in jail. And nobody can throw rocks, no and they flip over the jeep and burn them alive, those barbarian terrorists. The uh, French police do not enter. I once saw in a documentary about it. You cannot, and they don't enter there after 9 p.m. They're afraid. By 9, I guess it gets dark. Darkness, they don't come. Why? Too much of a risk. Who, one time they messed with them. They said they have to remove the burqa. The burqa? The burqa, they, they burned thousands of cars in Paris. Do you remember that night? All Paris was on fire. The Arabs. Same problem we have in Israel. You don't want to get them too angry. You don't want to surrender to them because they take over the country. And you don't want to mess with them because it's like a mafia. I'll give you an example. 17 buses were burned a few days ago in Tzfat. Each bus cost $300,000. Fancy ones. $300,000. 17 buses were burned. You had to see the whole parking lot is on fire. It broke my heart when I saw it. Wow. Then they say on the news that... It was over protection. You know, the gangster, they collect protection. So if you, so you don't surrender to them and give them their share, they begin to burn your property. But they don't say on the news that Arabs did it, Arab mafia. They don't. They hide that part. They cooperate with them. The lefties, the liberals, they love the Arab terrorists more than they love the righteous Jews. So they'll do everything they can to help them, directly, indirectly. So whenever they do something terrifying, 
they make sure not to say that it's an Arab. They write on the news, Israeli citizen did such and such. If you don't have connection inside in, with politicians like I do, I know politicians, I know people, I know the people inside the police, so I get the details. Most of the people don't know, they read on the news, they hide the fact that it's almost all the crimes are done by them. They hide it. They don't want you to find out. Like it's some kind of a surprise. But this particular time I found out that Ara burned 17 buses, but the owners of the bus company were also Arabs. So they even fight themselves. Protection. Criminals. It wasn't a terrorist. Terrorists, they come against Jews. This is Arabs against Arabs, just like you have, unfortunately, Jews against Jews, collecting protection, criminals. How do you have such thing that so many gangsters collect protection from thousands of businesses? I remember one time I gave a lecture in the house of a couple, husband and wife. They own a restaurant, fancy restaurant, famous. And I asked them, uh, you know, I heard that the head of the mafia is your partner in a restaurant. So they got very embarrassed. So we didn't ask for it. So what do you mean? One day he showed up and he said, hi, nice to meet you, I'm your new partner. From now on you have to, to send me a third of the income every week. Either I'll come or I send someone to pick up the envelope. But any problem you have with anyone, let me know right away. I'm your backup. That's it. Hi, nice to meet you. You invested $2 million in the business. You build it up. When you see the business is good, he shows up. Hi, my name is such and such. Here, check who I am. I'm your new partner from now on. They begin to make a few phone calls. Tgadal uh, v'itkadash I realized after everything went down the drain. Now yeah, your partner is a, <laughs> is a killer. What are you going to do? You have to pay him. You don't want, you're afraid to mess with him. Next thing they burn your car, next thing they burn your house, the next thing they burn you. You know what kind of people we're dealing with. That's the dirty world we live in. So three things. Giving donations to the Kohanim. Maser, 10%. A woman that went off the way. And Nazir, Nazareth. There is a connection between the three as you, as you understood. It's written in the Torah, the Rambam writes, Rambam, Maimonides, Derech Briyato Shel Adam, the way a person is created, and his nature, Liyot Nimshach Bedeotavu Bemaasav Achare Av Echaverav Enoek Emin Ag Anshe Medinato. A person is a product of the environment where he grew up. Grew up in a jungle, He's, a, he's a more a chimpanzee than a human being. Grew up on the trees, jumping like Tarzan and uh, what's that little kid that jumped on the trees? Huh? No, but he had a... Ah, no, it's a different thing. Uh, Mowgli, Mowgli? Mowgli. Grew up in a forest, he became like a monkey. Why? What do you expect? Grew up with monkeys, became a monkey. Grew up in a criminal neighborhood, shooting, cursing, everyone with tattoos, bad music, ta ta tam ta ta tam ta ta tam all day. That's what he becomes. Grew up in a German cold environment, somewhere in Berlin. That's what he is. Grew up in a warm Moroccan area, everyone hugging, kissing, mwah, mwah, 500 times. I have a friend like this. He's a barber. When you go to take a haircut by him, he's such a loving person. 
every customer that come, get from him at least 15 kisses and hugs. Once I told him, you lose business. The Ashkenazim are not ready, they're not equipped to get hugs and kisses, man to man, mwah, mwah, mwah. He said, I re-educate them. <laughs> 25 years later, he's still in business. Everybody loves him. Because even people who are not loving kisses and hugs, colder people, they see that it's coming from the heart. We have a rule in Judaism. Varim yotzim in alev, michnasim el alev. Even the coldest people, the, you, you see those yekes that have such mentality of European people, when they come, mwah, 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 they already got you. So, oh, they go like this. They pass the attack, they see it, they cut the Baruch Hashem, ishtabar shevo. So you see that where you grow up, that's who you become, more or less. You grow up in a Hasidic cheder, you, Baruch Hashem, you're serious, you're learning, you watch your eyes, you watch modesty. If it was a good one, strict one. You grow up in a modern place, you become modern. That's the words of the Rambam. You don't have to be a genius to know it. We all understand that even without reading the Rambam. It's obvious. You see it everywhere you go. The Torah warned, Leviticus 18, verse 3. The Torah warns, the acts of the land of Egypt that you were sitting there, do not dare to do. The Chachamim explain, Yashavtem Baal Dat Atzmechem. It's your fault that you were sitting in Egypt, in the land of Egypt. I arranged for you a separate Jewish territory, the land of Goshen. I put in the mind of Pharaoh to offer you a place that is for Jews only, a country of Jews in Egypt, and they're all together. They can follow their tradition of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It wasn't good enough for them. They wanted to move to Manhattan, to San Francisco, to Las Vegas, to LA, to the village. Everywhere, Miami, just like the Jews here. They have places of Jews. They have Williamsburg, they have Borough Park, they have Monsey, they have Lakewood, and some other neighborhoods of Jews only. But it's not good enough for some of them. They need to move to Miami. Should I tell them what's in Miami or no? Someone I won. His mother wanted to move to Miami. I said, it's, it's going to be the end of her life if she does. And she did try. How quick she returned back to New York, who knows? Huh? One month. Do you know how difficult it is to move to Miami and to come back to New York within a month? And her son told her, but I told you in the name of Rabbi Mizrahi that it's, gonna, it's Sodom and Gomorrah over there. Don't let anyone fool you. Don't let the people that move to Miami tell you stories. You move there, you finished. That's the truth. You and your children, you finished. Remember my words. Don't say, oh, nobody told us how horrible it is. The atmosphere of a place with beaches and naked people walking on the street will destroy every holiness. For me, it was enough one time to be there, and we needed to get something from a pharmacy. I went there for Shabbat Chatan, someone that I owe a lot of gratitude to. I couldn't say no. So I went there Friday, coming back Sunday. And uh, we needed to get something from a pharmacy, put pharmacy in a, in a, Google, in a GPS. It takes us to a pharmacy somewhere around the area. I'm waiting in a car. I cannot believe people come out of the pharmacy, women with bathing suit. I thought I'm dreaming. By the way, you have to close your eyes. In the middle of the street, people walk with bathing suit. Now you have religious kids that grew up in yeshivot here in Brooklyn. 
You're going to move over there, you go to the pharmacy to buy something, you need pills. You can walk in the street with your kids when women walk with bathing suit in the middle of the street, forget about the beach, the street, in the store. Come on, who are you fooling? Real estate went up, became triple over there. Everything will crash to zero. Not only there, here also. We are now entering one of the worst recessions in the history of the world. The, war, the worst, what happened in the last few days in the market, you don't have to be an expert to understand that this country and the rest of the world will collapse to, to the dust. I see the anger of Hashem, of what's happening in the world, that it became Sodom and Gomorrah. It started with COVID, then now the war that destroys the rest of the world. And I'm very much afraid from the next strike that is coming. My, uh, my feeling is that within a year, everything in this country will crash. All the banks, all the real estate, all the retail, everything. And I don't have to tell you how dangerous it is for society, especially for Jews. Because we're going to have millions of goyim here with no income at all. With, say, seven, ten dollars a gallon of gas. Nobody can go to... You have to go to work, it will cost you $100 gas and tolls, and they pay you $150 a day. So people will decide to take a gun and go and start robbing people. It's going to be a disaster what's going to happen here. I said it yesterday in my lecture, do not wear expensive watches. If you have a fancy car, get rid of it. You will regret it if you don't get rid of it. You're going to go to some area, parking lot, people will follow you, you come out of the car. If they drive an expensive car, someone will put a gun to your head. It happens every hour now. Just a matter of who's next. Try not to walk on the streets at all if there's really not a, an urgent matter. Definitely not in bad neighborhoods, definitely not at night. And you have to... Pray with tears to Hashem just to stay safe. To have what to eat and to stay alive. Mark my words. We will, hopefully will be around in a year from now. And you can see back what I told you today and what will happen next year. <sighs> Why is it? Why Hashem is so angry at the world? Give me one reason why not to. Look what's going on. Abomination, parades, gay marriage, all this Sodom and Gomorrah thing. Everyone is naked. So much corruption, such liars, politicians, such traitors. The world lost any dignity it ever had. Completely. Nothing is left. Nothing is left. Even among religious communities, the corruption, corruption penetrated. Violence, fighting, beating up each other over honor and money and who's going to be in charge. If you see what's happening even in some yeshivot that used to have such good name. Now over there there's fighting and this and politics. How long HaKadosh Baruch Hu can tolerate what's going on in the world? So the world needs a real shake-up, serious shake-up. What's going to happen now? Tomorrow, they're going to increase the rate again, the interest rate, probably by 0.75%. That means people that would like to get mortgages, they will pay now extra 2% on a mortgage, extra 2% in the last few months. Increase of 2% to the mortgage. You know what it means? People thought that houses will continue to go higher and higher and higher and higher. Three million, four million, five million. Houses that 25 years ago were $250,000 now are three million dollars. What's going on over here? What exactly happened that the house now worth ten times more in 20 years? What's going on here? The answer here, it's all a balloon. Balloon of illusion. What does it mean balloon? An illusion. Why? They lower the interest rate to zero. People used to get mortgage for 3% instead of 9% it used to be. 20-something years ago. 
So the 3%, it's not really that bad. Because even if you take a $2 million mortgage, 3% on $2 million, it's 60,000 a year. It's only 5,000 a month. If you have a good business, 5,000 to live in a nice mansion, why not? But now, it's not 5,000 anymore. It's going to be six, 7,000 now. Plus, energy prices is double, so add another 1,000 almost. That's a big difference. People will begin to not pay. Remember, this was coming after two years that many people don't pay their mortgages. They're in the middle of foreclosure now. Who is going to take all the loss? The banks. Remember what happened in 2008? Give it a few months, you see what's going to happen here. That means people that just bought a house now for $3 million in a year from now will worth half or less. Why? It's all go by the monthly payment. Somebody rich told me, I've been waiting for this day for a long time. Why? I want real estate to collapse. Why? That I can buy 10 apartments. Right now I cannot buy one. When it's collapsed by 80%, it will go down. 2 million will become 600,000, 500,000. I go buy myself a few houses. And then they will start going up again, like it was from 2008. I say, yeah, but what happens if you're going to come to your bank and your bank put a sign, we're out of business. And all your money is gone. Then what? What do you think, your money in the bank is safe? Do you, do you remember what happened in 2008, how many banks went out of business? The government did a brilliant move. It was a Jew, Bernanke. He was the right man at the right time. He forced 19 banks, he gave them help, to buy all the banks who went bankrupt. That's how the customers got saved. Otherwise, you know, it w there would be hundreds of thousands of lawsuits against the United States for the FDIC. The government wanted to save their own skin. They forced the big sharks to swallow the small ones. Can they do it again now? I doubt it very much. I don't know. Now, now, when something like this happened, what's the, what's the best advice to give? You may think, hold on to your money. Don't buy. Don't do things, right? Let's see what Hashem say. Who can give us the best advice? Me? You? No. Hashem. Let's read. Gemara. Masechet Gitin, page 7. Im roe adam shemezonotav metzumtzamim. If a person see that he lose a lot of his income. He used to make 20,000 a month. Now he went down to 10. And now he's soon going down to seven. What are you thinking? Let me cut. Not buy things. I won't replace cars. I won't buy any luxury, no jewelry, no watches. And of course, I will cut my charity. Right? That's the first thing that the people do. The Gemara says, You lost 50% of your income or your assets. What do you do with the other 50%? Run to give a lot of tzedakah. If you do that, you are konet olamcha. That's what Hashem said to Avraham after nine tests he passed. He did not get the stamp from Hashem yet. In the tenth one, that finally he got a child, and Hashem said, take your child and slaughter him in a Moriah mountain, and he ran to do it. Hashem told him, now you're getting my stamp. That you're God-fearing man. Why? I fell into the fire for you. I'm not a God-fearing man. I did so many things. I'm not a God-fearing man. You are. But now you're getting the stamp. You know why? Because you are willing to give me something that is the most precious to you right now in your life. That's when you get my stamp for life, for eternity. So now, when people see they lost a lot of their money, or they're losing, or the market crash, or business is not as good, or the value of their house is going down, and they get nervous, 
What does Hashem say? Now I want to see how much you give. Double your tzedakot. Why? Because I count on you. I know nature, not nature. We are above the nature. In the end, every bullet is an address. And every dollar is an address. Where is it going to go? Who is going to win? Who is going to lose? It's all Hashem's decision. To forget, don't ever forget for a minute that it's all in the end of Hashem. So, that's the power of faith. As Chazal say, Aser te Aser. Aser bishvil shetit asher. Give 10% that you should become wealthy. Even in a time of recession, or depression, or pandemic, or war. Why? Tzedakah count like all other mitzvot combined. That's Baba Batra, page 9. So, I go back to the Rambam. The Torah, the Rambam says, a person is a creation, is a product of the environment, of society. The Torah warns, Do not behave like those Egyptians. I don't want to see their filth coming into your houses. I don't want you to dress like them. I don't want you to behave like them. I don't want you to imitate them in any way, especially their idol worshipping and their lack of modesty. Two things that I hate the most. Remember, everything I'm telling you now about Egypt applied to today here in New York, or Miami, or Israel, or anywhere else. Same concept. Nothing has changed. The same thing Hashem told us about Egypt, He definitely said about New York. What? Kemas, the Orach Haim HaKadosh, 300 years ago. He says, Kemase Eretz Mitzrayim asher yeshavtem ba'a, v'chi yesh Eretz Mitzrayim acheret? What does it mean, Eretz Mitzrayim, that you said there? Do you know another Egypt? Why do you have to waste few words in the Torah? Don't do the act of the Egyptians. What do you mean? Don't do the act of, the, of Egypt that you said there. We all know that we said there. Why do you have to tell us where we said? The answer is, because the Egyptians were all sexually corrupted, behaving worse than animals, and the nation of Israel in the beginning were isolated from them, so it didn't affect them, but then the Jews wanted to move to Egypt, like it's written in the verse, Malar Etzotam. The land of Egypt was full of Jews all of a sudden. That's what triggered the attention of the Egyptians that soon the Jews will make a revolution and join the enemy and take over Egypt. That's what started the Holocaust in Egypt, the slavery. So the Orach Haim said once they moved there and they started to see how the Egyptians behave, there is no such thing. It would not affect the most religious Jews. You want to live to, in Vegas, or in Miami, or in Manhattan? Do you think it's not going to affect your religious level? Or your spiritual level? You are dreaming. You are a faker. There's no such thing living among wicked people and not become like them. That's why I have so many modern Orthodox people who barely keeps anything right. Barely. Modesty is not modesty, kosher food is not kosher food, televisions in the house, filthy movies, internet, no filters, ever, mamash almost like goyim. And then they say I'm orthodox. The women wear pants, shorts, mini skirts, all kinds of open things, sleeve, sleeveless shirts. And they say I'm orthodox, no covering the hair, no nothing. And then when someone like me come and say the truth, they get angry. Instead of saying, you're right, we went so low. You're right, you're right. Bezrat Hashem hopefully will repent. One out of a hundred maybe admit. So you're right. I, had, I have a, where, where my mother lived, in the synagogue. One guy. 
can I donate to, to what you do, books, CDs? He's a hard-working guy. I said, no, it's okay. No, no, please, I, I want to have a schut. So when he came to give the money, he said, listen, I'm religious, but what kind of religious I am? Look at me. You look at me, you know who I am. I wish I was real. So if I'm not in the right level, at least let me have a, a share in what you do. If something I will be able to say one day is that I did care that other Jews at least will be religious. If I myself not religious to the right level. You understand or no? But how many like this you have? The other one said, no, we are better than you. You're a fanatic, you're an extreme. Fanatic? My, my little son told me today, Abba, you're so fanatic. <laughs> today. We had to go make passports today, so I had to pick him up. You know how long you have to wait for a passport now? Three months. In Israel here. Look what Hashem did to the world. And it's very expensive. If you want to expedite it and this and that with the picture and everything, it's more than $200 a person. If you have a family of six, seven people, it's $1,500 just to renew passport. And it takes a long time to get it. You may miss your flights, your whole, your entire plans. So we were talking about certain things. What made him think I'm fanatic? Because I said the kid should not have blorit. You know, that they have the hair all the way up, like a horn over a nice horse. A mohawk, whatever you want to call it. Now it's the new style. The whole head shave. Pon pon. Pon pon. Filin, natural filin. Doesn't even need filin. He can design it square with zero. <laughs> so when you say to a kid, that's not what Hashem wants, he thinks you're crazy. Well, everyone has it now. Go to every yeshiva, everyone have hair. One important Talmud Chacham was staying by me a month or two ago. Before I went to Israel, he told me, Rabbi Yosef, he's right. It's everywhere now like this. Even my own children like this. And he's a very important Chacham. What are we going to do? We have to leave the energy to fight with them and argue with them to the things that are more critical. Because if we're going to argue about everything, we lose the war in advance. So, what are we trying to to prevent the real serious crimes that they're about to do? That's how sad the situation is. It's like a cancer, spreading everywhere. I then will go to Israel. I just hope he, rel he remember when he come back that he was in Israel and not in Dubai. Anyway, so Rav Zalman Sorotskin, in his famous book Oznaim La Torah, Years to the Torah, someone who delay his donations to the Kohen, what he obligates to give, ten percent, from what his fields produced, right? Why does he have to get such a punishment than his wife beginning to behave uh, not properly? Why? The answer is, today people do not see that when their parnasa goes down, they don't necessarily understand that Hashem is punishing them from the way they behave. Because people have low, low level of faith. So when someone comes and say, check what you do wrong, they get angry. Rabbi, why are you judgmental? Why are you so judgmental? Because the Torah is judgmental. The Torah says, if you lose, that means Hashem is me judgment on you right now. If you're sick, if you got injured, if you broke a bone or anything like that, that means Hashem is angry at you. Hashem is not an, he doesn't have a, a roulette. Today we're going after Binyamin. Tomorrow after Yitzchak. It doesn't work that way. You got a smack. You got robbed. 
Someone insulted you. Someone stole from you. Someone ruined your reputation. Shake yourself. That's rule number one in Judaism. Pash fesh b'maasecha, the Gemara say. Ah! Why are you judgmental? Why? What was the Holocaust? We don't know. Was it a gift or was it a punishment? No, don't say the whole punishment. Hashem doesn't punish. People force a life of a lie. Want to live in a lie. Why? It's sweet. And it doesn't bother the conscience. It doesn't bother. So, if a person, in the old days, when a woman sees that her husband brings less and less money, why is it? Because he doesn't give the maser. And he doesn't get wealthy. The opposite. Hashem leaves him 10% and takes 90% like the Gaon Mivimna say. You know what it's written. Im taimin asmeila. Im tasmeil aimina. The Gaon Mivimna say, what does it mean? How do you write maser? Mem, ayin, shin, and resh. Four letters. Mem, ayin, shin, resh. Measer and measer, the same spelling. Only one tiny difference. On the shin, on the top you have a dot. If the dot is on the left of the shin, it's measer. If the dot is on the right, it's measer. The sin becomes shin. That's it. What's the difference? When the dot is on the left, you measer. You give 10% from your income. When the dot is on the right, you measer, meaning you become wealthy. The Gaon Mivilna said the secret on this verse is like this. That Lot and Avraham, their shepherds had an argument. Avraham said to Lot, his nephew, choose any side you want. Lot looked, one side is green, one side is desert. You need the green for the sheep. Avraham is giving him sheep for free, gift. Instead of saying to his rich uncle, you take the, other, the green side. You have more than me and everything I have came from you. So you choose first. No, he chose the green side. And leave the desert side for his uncle that just gave him a lot of sheep. That's Lot. So Avram said to Lot, if you go left, I go right. If you go right, I go left. Be my guest, choose. The Gaon Mivilna said, you know the secret over here? This is what Hashem said to the Jew. If you put the dot on the left, I will move it to the right. If tasmil, ani I mean, I will move it to the right. You give 10%, I'll make you rich. I take the dot from the left and move it to the right and make you rich. If you don't give the 10%, that means you want to make yourself rich. You're putting the dot on the right. Measher. Yourself. Thinking by not giving tzedakah, I'm going to be wealthier. I'm going to remove the dot from the right and put it on the left. And leave you 10% and take 90%. So make your choice. You want willingly to give 10% and become rich? Or you want to hold everything to yourself and be in the end left with 10%? That's it. So when the wife sees that her husband left for 10% and all the nice money that she used to get from him is all gone, she's beginning to get angry about his crimes and his sins. Why Hashem is punishing us like this? When a woman is upset and depressed and doesn't have money and she feels that Hashem punishes her husband because he's not righteous anymore, what's the first thing she's going to do? Drink wine. To forget the depression. Once she drinks, she's going to go and talk to the construction worker. Why? She's not here. Her mind is in a different planet. That's the connection. You don't give the master to the Kohen. Don't be surprised if you're going to have to see the Kohen when your wife cheated. Or suspecting her that she cheated. And when someone sees what she does has to remove himself from the wine. Look what the wine caused. Wine is not necessarily wine. It's any kind of alcohol. I want to ask you a question. Where exactly a person has a chance to see a woman bekilkula? Rashi writes, when you bring her to the Kohen in Bet HaMikdash and the Kohen take her cover of her head off, 
and open her hair, and everybody there gets shocked. A married woman without the hair cover? It's shock. Not like today, every woman on the street is without covering the hair. People got used to it. When Korach wanted to collect 250 leaders to rebel against Moshe, they came to the house of one important righteous leader on Ben Pelet. They needed him for the, polit for the pol political argument. His wife wanted to save him from going and joining the wicked people in, against Moshe and Hashem. She knew they're going to be buried in the end. Hashem is not going to let such a thing go. What did she do? She came outside, stood by the door and took off the cover of her hair. The most wicked people who started a war against Moshe, after they heard that God speaks to him and nominated him to be the prophet and the leader, so he did not choose to be the leader. Hashem actually forced him to be. They know it, but their jealousy kills them. They can't control it. So they decided to declare a revolution. So they need to gain a, a, a lot of leaders. They came to the house of On Ben Pellet. His wife took off the cover. He saw her. They, ran. She, they, got, they almost dropped dead. They ran like they saw the devil. Look at the contradiction a person can live in. In modesty, they were very strict. See a hair of a married woman, I'd rather die not to see. At the same time, they rebel a war against God. Same time. That's my lecture from last week. Person live in contradiction. Within a minute, you can be a servant of Hashem and 30 seconds later, a soldier of the devil. Within a minute. Within a minute. It doesn't take that long to turn 180 degrees. You see it all the time. All the time. <sighs> Rashi writes, do you bring donation to the Kohen? The Kohen has to go to the place where the wheat is, beta granot, to receive the donation. What does it mean, sacrifice to the Kohen? Sacrifice is to bring it closer to the Kohen. We are not talking now about the wheat. Wheat, the Kohen come to collect. What do you have to bring to the Kohen? Bikurim, the first fruit that grows on your tree. First fruit, the best fruit, the first one that grows. That's what you have to bring to the house of God. So that's what we're talking here about. Yakrivu, in numeric value, is Hem Abikurim, 328. Ba'al say. Ish, ish, Why do you have the word ish twice? Man, man, that his wife starting to go off. Why do you need to say man, man? This is not Harlem here. Hey, what's up, man, man, man? This is a divine language here. So why do you have to say ish, ish? Obviously, there's a secret here. Why do you have to duplicate the many ish? Because we are talking about two kinds of anashim, two kinds of people, two kinds of men. One regular man who is in control of his wife and one a defective man who is defective, deaf, cannot hear, cheresh, Shote cannot tell the difference between good and bad. Somehow people like that also got married. Who is going to marry a Shote today? Huh? Tell a woman, I have a great Shidduch for you. He's a son of a very rich man. But he cannot tell the difference between good and bad. If you give him $10,000, he's going to throw it. He doesn't know the value of... He doesn't know, it's Shote. He's a Democrat. Everything Hashem hates, he loves. Everything Hashem loves, he hates. Shote. So, you want to marry him? Talk. Marry him. That's what the Gemara says. Listen. Ma Talmud lomar ish ish le rabot to include eshet chiresh, a wife of a deaf person. 
deaf cannot communicate with learning Torah, keeping mitzvot, because he never heard a, a, a voice. He was born deaf. It's disconnected from the world. Eshet Shote, a wife of a dummy, a fool. Eshet Shamum. What's Shamum? Who knows? No one in Israel knows this word. Don't feel bad that you don't know it. Not Shiamum. Shiamum is when you bought. What Shamum? Huh? Timhoni. How do you say in English Timhoni? Weirdo. A weirdo. Talk to himself, look at, walk on the street, looking at things, you know. Very strange person. Timoni. That's called Shamum. That her husband went across the ocean. He went to Europe. From Israel, he went to Europe now. And, oh, he's in jail. He was put in jail for a few years. And the wife began to do bad things. She's starting to talk to somebody else. She's still married. Never got to get. What does the Torah say to do in such thing? The husband is not there to be zealous. To take her to the Kohen. So who has to do it? Bedin, the Jewish court. They come to her, they give her a warning. If she continue, what, is she, what are they going to do? They cannot take her to the Kohen. Because it's written in Torah that the man has to take his wife to the Kohen. Meaning the man and not Bedin. Aval Bedin give her a warning. Do not go with that person, your married woman. And if she did it one more time with witnesses that testify in the Bedin, they come to her, police, give us your ktuba. Ktuba, it's a bill of right that a woman gets in a time of marriage. That when her husband died or divorced her, she's going to get a big amount of money. And she comes before all the other creditors. Whoever he owes money, she's first. The wife comes before the kids, for everyone. First, they have to give her from, from his estate, and the rest they give to the others. So she has a strong protection. Women used to sell their ktubot in their lifetime. If a woman didn't have enough money from her husband, let's say it's cheap, doesn't give her enough. And he wrote to her in the, in the time of the wedding, maybe he drank a lot. So the rabbi asked him in the ktubah, how much you want to write? 555,000, $555.55. Seven digits of five against Ainara, you know, Hamsa, 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 all over. 55,000, it's a lot of money. So she see her husband is a cheapo. She said to her cousin, I will sell you my ktuba. How much? Give me 40,000, it's yours. When my husband died, you're going to get 55,000. What i supposed to get, I transfer the right to you. Possible, it's a lot to do. So if the bedding warned her not to go and speak to someone that is not her husband and she did it anyway, they come and take her ktuba and rape it. So if it's written a million dollars over there, she just lost a million dollars. If it's 50,000, she lost her right. That means when her husband can, uh, come out of jail or come back from his trip across the ocean, the bedding inform him what she did. And if he divorces her, she gets nothing. By the way, the same law applies if a married woman walks on the street without her head cover. She loses all her rights immediately, one time. Go and tell it to the women today. One time she walks in the street without head cover, and two witnesses testify in a divorce, divorce case, she doesn't get a penny, nothing. She loses all her rights. Just to show you the severity of lack of modesty. And people think it's a joke. Someone asked me, a, a righteous woman, that her family is doing a Brit Milah at 7 p.m. That they can do a big party at night. No style. The Torah says do the Brit first thing in the morning. Don't wait for the afternoon. 
Now it's not afternoon. Seven. They say seven. It will start at eight. You have until 8.28. Sunset. They can still do the, the chituch at eight. And then they sit, wash their hands, and the suda is already the next day. So she asked, this is modern people, religious but modern. They want a lot of people to come, so they do it in the evening after people finish to, you know, to work. But it's going to be mixed seating. But the dancing will be separate. Mixed seating. Let's analyze this concept of mixed seating. When you walk to a restaurant in Flatbush here, there's a restaurant, kosher restaurant, there's mixed seating everywhere. The restaurant doesn't make a section for men and women. It can be families, husband and wife, daughters, boys, sitting all together, table here, table here, men here, woman there. There's no separation. When you eat on Shabbat meal, guests coming, cousin, aunts, this, that, you sit everyone in a table. Unless you streak Hasid, some Hasidim does one room for men, one room for women. Tov. Kol ha-machmir tavo alav abracha. But there's really no obligation to separate the family. You sit and you eat. But when you go to a wedding and it's mixed seating, it's not the same. Why it's not the same? Because in a wedding you have a big amount of people coming to the wedding and many of them are not religious at all. Secular people. Yeah, relatives, secular. Chalalei Shabbat. And their women do not understand the word modest. Please come with modest clothes. You know, they have no idea what modest clothes is. Modest for them is not a bikini. Anything that is not a bikini is modest in their eyes. Everything is open, this, that, completely. So what happened? You're a religious man. You're not going to participate in a party with mixed dancing. So they assure you that you're going to have dancing for men, dancing for women. They put a, a mechitza, a wall. Baruch Hashem. But now you sit in a table and now you want to get up and walk. You have to walk between the round tables, right? What do you think happened over there? All the not-dressed women walk from all directions. You want to go to the right, a woman comes from here. You want to go to the left, a woman comes from there. It's like being on a beach. No difference. Well, the way they dress these women, with the high heels and mini skirts and everything open. So can you participate in such a place? The Torah say that a place like this, Hashem runs away from this place like running away from fire. Hashem cannot enter such a place. So what's the point of going? You're going to a breed that Hashem is not there? What's the point? Ah, now we have a, a different problem. The family will be offended. There's always... The Satan is a great lawyer. Trust me, he went to Harvard Law School before Hussein Obama. So right away he presents a case. Shame on you, you ungrateful religious Jew. Your brother helped you when you got married. He, le he lent you money and this. Now he's making a mixed party and you're not going to come to say Mazal Tov? That's what religion is? He gets scared. How can I be ungrateful to my brother? He helped me out. It's true. Okay, so I'm going to break the rules. I'm going to go to a mixed party. God forbid. God forbid. All the laws of gratefulness, Akarata Tov, it's conditional that the person does not commit a crime right now. If he commits a crime, even if I owe him his, his, my life, I don't, I'm not allowed to participate in his crime. My obligation is to stop the crime. So if I put myself over there and I won't stop that mixed party, all the sins are on me. You have to rebuke them. So better not to go because you know you're not going to rebuke them and you know they're not going to listen. You will be punished and you will be punished for allowing it to happen. 
Why would you like to put yourself there? One time a big rabbi came to be Mesader Kiddushin. Chupa. And he saw that the people are anxious, when will he leave? He was eating something, and he's supposed to leave and go give a lecture. He has a lecture after the chupa, and he came with his assistant. His assistant said to him, Rabbi, we are late. He said, we're not going anywhere. We're staying here until the end of the night. He said, what happened, Rabbi? People are waiting for us. We have a lecture. Call and cancel or send someone else to replace me. I'm staying here until midnight. Why, Rabbi? Why? Because as soon as I get out of the door, they take off the mechitza, the separation, and guys and girls gonna start dancing with the non-Jewish music. As long as I'm here, they embarrass from me. I'm the Rabbi of the city. Next to me, they won't do it. They embarrass. So it's my obligation to stay. I'm stuck here. I'm going to be their policeman. Yes. How did the rabbi know that what he does he must do? How did he know? He learned it from Abai in the Gemara. He had a neighbor. What was it, Abai or Avashi? That he saw. Abai, he saw that he had a neighbor, two neighbors, boy and a girl. He has to go and give a shiur in yeshiva in the morning. And they, are, they agree the night before that he's going to give her a ride. He has a, a horse or a donkey with a carriage, a little carriage from wood. And he has to go, I don't know, to Lud from Yerushalayim. And she has to go to, go to the same area. So he's going to give her a ride to single guys and guy and girl. It wasn't like today you have road, you're sitting in your BMW with the air condition, you know, thousands of cars on a road. You had to go through the forest, you know, and no one is there. It's you and her and the trees. And Hashem, of course. When the rabbi heard that that's what they're about to do, he decided tomorrow there's no class in yeshiva. My obligation to follow them to make sure that when they're about to touch each other and commit a sin, I will be there screaming fire. They're about to lose your Olam Abba, she's Nida, this, you're going to make two horrible sins from the Torah right now. One of them is a cut for your soul permanently. Boyfriend and girlfriend without mikveh. That's it. You're done. He followed them for hours, hours, hours. An old man, follow a young couple, boy and a girl, neighbors. When they reach the intersection, she has to go to the left, he has to go to the right. They did not touch each other. The entire ride they spoke the Torah, kept modesty. They separated, thank you for the ride, goodbye. The rabbi fell on the mud and started to cry. Somebody found him, rabbi. Hashem irachem, what are you doing here crying in the mud? What happened? See, see that guy over there on a, on a carriage? Yeah. See that girl walking over there? Yeah. I've been following them from Yerushalayim all the way for hours. No. What happened? The guy got nervous. They didn't touch each other even by the finger. No, not even a handshake. They kept their face straight, didn't look at each other, nothing. Uh, nothing was against the law, nothing. So the guy was happy. Baruch Hashem, look how holy our nation is. Why are you crying? He said, you don't get it. If I would be him, I would commit a sin with her. I wouldn't be able to hold my Yetzirah for so many hours with this pretty girl. So I'm thinking to myself, look at this ordinary guy, young guy is better than me, me and my old Torah. That's not a surprise, because the Torah says, Kol agadol mi chavero, yitzro gadol imenu. The greater you are in spirituality, and your level go higher and higher, the harder it is for you. Your yetzer hara, your evil inclination is growing constantly. As you grow spiritually, your tests grow rapidly, accordingly.
רש"י רייץ, עם מסכת סוטה, הנה גמרא, פייג' 2. הרואה סוטה בקלקולה. A woman that is going off while she is בקלקולה. Not in the middle when she was talking to another man. When she, are, when she is already by the Kohen and he took off the cover of her hair. And they put the name of God in the water and she's about to drink it. By the way, did you ever wonder why they have to put sand inside the glass? We understand the name of God, right? They put the, the, the name of God. And we, you know, we put it in the water. It gets erased and she has to drink it. But why is sand? Why you have to put sand in a glass? Yeah. I don't know, but maybe it's connected for, like, when you die, you have to go back to the ground. So she could die, but she could also be blessed with a child, but she must go to the ground, too. In America, they say, nice try. <laughs> At 2,000 Fahrenheit, sand turns into glass. And turn into, and what's the glass has to do with Isha Sota? You said sand and glass, that's why I connected. I'll tell you the secret. The Gemara say, in Pirkei Avot, Istakel b'shlosha dvarim, ve'e ata ba lidvar avera. Every time you're about to commit a sin, your desire is boiling. There are three things should be in front of your eyes. Remember where you came from, from a, from a stinky drop, drop of sperm, that's where you came from, liquid, that's the water of the Isha Sota, water, for the liquid. And where are you going to end? You're going into the grave and the worm will eat you up, so you're going into the sand, that's why they put sand in a glass. ולפני מי אתה עתיד ליתן דין וחשבון? On who is going to judge you? השם. The Kohen is a messenger of God in Bet HaMikdash. He is going to judge now if this woman would live or die. If she would remember those three things, she would never dare to start talking to the guy on the street or somewhere. By the way, there is a... Interesting Mishnah. Uh, Adam, Adam saw two. What does it mean, Adam saw two? Adam did not see three things. He didn't have three things to see. Because when uh, we came from a drop of swim, all of us, right? What made us? Our father. But Adam didn't have a father. Hashem actually designed him. He didn't come from a drop. So from those three things, he can only look at two. Where is he going to? To the sand. You must return to the sand. And you're going to be judged in front of Hashem. Two things. But he doesn't have where you came from. Where I came from, I'm a, I'm a creation of God. If Adam had three things to look at, maybe he wouldn't commit the sin. That's this Midrash Mishnah. So the, the point is like this. Where, where exactly is her kilkula? In Bet HaMikdash, in the Azara of Bet HaMikdash. Who is going to see her? People that are in the highest level of holiness. They came to Bet HaMikdash to sacrifice a sheep and to pray to Hashem in the holiest place in the world. After mikveh, coming, sacrificing, praying, you know, the highest moment of their life. And what did they get instead? A married woman that the Kohen took off the cover of her hair and she screamed and it's such an embarrassment. The husband over there. And then when she drinks from the water, if she did cheat, her face become green, her eyes pops out. It's a very scary thing. And her stomach goes on fire and explode. Explode, like a bomb. Boom. Terrible way to die. And as soon as she die, 
The Kohen scream, take her out quickly. Why? Because it's a dead body. They are Kohanim here. She will impurify the whole place to mat oil. So the person that came to Bet HaMikdash thought it's the luckiest day of my life. Finally, I come to sacrifice. And instead, what does he get? A horror show. A trauma for life. Remember, you have to imagine how life was 2,000 years ago. Don't think about it as an American. Married woman, big deal, she cheated. It's in style now. She's going to get a talk show. Wow, you're so open-minded. You're so advanced. We have open relationship. You never fools like this. Please forget about the Sodom and Gomorrah around us. Try to remember how holy people were. And a married woman is about to die now because she, she did something. So, 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 something like this. When, when did it ever happen? If something like this happened. Why did I have to see it? On the day I came to Bet HaMikdash, that's what happened? It's very early. Why did it have to happen when I came? Two weeks. I came with my donkey all the way from Tzfat to Yerushalayim. The donkey died on the way. Now, imagine the nightmare. Finally, I arrived to Yerushalayim. I come, I go to the market, I buy the sheep. I gather the sheep on my shoulders. I, I climb all the way in the mountain in, a, in, a, in 110 degrees. A month of August, Tammuz. I bring it to the Kohen. And that's what I have to see in the Azara. What a punishment. That's why the Gemara says, if you saw it, Hashem directed you to see it. It's no coincidence. You saw an accident on a road, Hashem took you from there to see that accident. Why? To warn you, you are next. Wake up. If you see tragedies, if you had to see it, it's a wake up call for you. Your friend went in a different direction, didn't see it. Or he came five minutes later, that was not there anymore. Nothing is random. Everything has, Shem is talking to you. Dog is barking at you, the goy is hitting you, cursing you on the street, a car passed by, scream at you, you dirty Jew. Everything is directed exactly from Rosh Hashanah. That that's what's going to be, and that's what you're going to get, and this one will steal from you, and you're going to lose it that day, and a call directed. And if you think anything is random, Shem Yirachem, it's time to wake up. But I want to ask you a question. After a person saw such a thing, he has to remove himself from a wine? Will he ever dare to cheat? By the way, the whole idea of this woman, it's only going to work, it's only going to work if the man is clean. If he's also a cheater, she's going to drink from the water, even though she cheated, nothing will happen to her. It only helps if the man is clean. So now, if a woman knows her husband is a cheater, and she go and cheat, she's not going to die from the water. Why? He brought it on himself. Mida keneged mida, measure for measure. She knew, that's why she allowed herself also to do it, not, not being afraid of it, such a horrible death. Because remember what Rashi said in Parashat Acharemot, the first Rashi, two kinds of doctor. One said to his patient, don't drink cold and don't stay in a cold place that you may get sick. And the other doctor said the same thing, but he added one more line that you're not going to get sick like this person who did it and died. Rashi said, which doctor is more productive? The one who just said, don't do it because you may get sick, or the one that said, don't do it because you may get sick and die like that person who did it? Which doctor actually scared the patients and saved his life? The one that scared him. If it's like this with a regular physical doctor, physician, it's needless to say with the rabbi that he's a, he's a doctor of the soul. And his job is to get the people scared from their, what's, gonna, what's coming for them. If they're not going to make adjustment in their lifestyle. And repentance. So Rashi says, since uh, 
act of fear makes a person very scared, he doesn't have the mind to commit a sin after he sees such a horrible thing. How many times we drove fast in the highway and then we saw a horrible accident and how people finish their life and immediately we stop for the rest of the day shaken up by what we saw. Oh my God, what a way to die. It happened a few times in life. Why? The fear works. Fear works. So if a person saw how this woman just fell and died and all the screaming and they're taking her body out, what do you need to warn him now? Remember, don't touch wine. You have to tell me not to touch wine. After what I saw, I'll never in my life dare to do something not kosher. Right or wrong? The answer, Abotai, is even when a person sees the worst punishment that someone else did, got, the desire of arayot, arayot, men and women, sexual crimes, and apotropos la arayot is so strong that even when a person knows that he's going to enjoy 10 minutes, but after that he's going to suffer for the rest of his life, guarantee, in advance, he's still not going to stop himself. And it reminds me about one time a person came, Israeli stupid person that lived in Manhattan, and he said that he got HIV when he just started, like 20 something years ago. It was new. And what happened to him? He met a Brazilian woman in a club in Manhattan. And he went to commit a sin with her. And just before, she told him, I want you to know I have uh, AIDS, HIV. And he still went with her. Why? Like a dog cannot control his desire. And now suffer for the rest of his life. I wonder if he's alive, Bechlan. What do you see from here? Person knows that he's going to enjoy X amount of minutes and then die, and he's still stupid enough to do it. All of us are like that, more or less. i give you an example. When you have no patience when you drive, you have two lanes, one lane north, one lane south, and you have a truck on the way in Saddam, on the way to Elat. It drives you crazy. It's like a snake, the road. One lane. And there is a truck driving 40 miles an hour. That's it. And you don't have a vision. Because it goes around the mountain. You don't know who's going to come around the curve. To save five minutes on a ride. Because soon you're going to get to an intersection. You're going to go around him. To save five minutes, you're willing to gamble on your life. Hundreds of accidents like this you have here. People pass the truck, accelerate, another truck comes from around the corner, boom. They hit each other face to face. Hundreds of times a year. What's the logic behind it? Saving five minutes for my day? On a cause of May, 50% to die. 50% chance to die. What a terrible choice. Look what it means, lack of patience. And the same person, when he gets finally to his house, will waste four hours on nonsense. But for the five minutes, he was willing to die. But then he got home, sitting with his belly, eating watermelon seeds watching some stupid basketball, few people jump like monkeys. What is your life? Sport, this, soccer, boxing. That's his life. Nothing. Pure waste of time. Burning his entire life, no problem. Five minutes on the road drives him crazy. Why? You see that people are not rational. Now I'm going to tell you a Midrash Rabotai that will keep you shaken up. I think we'll finish after that. 
איש איש כי תסטה אשתו ומעלה מעל. Now you're going to, don't ever forget what you're about to learn now. It's unbelievable. הגמרא אין מסכת ברכות, page 31. is bringing a story about חנה. Who is חנה? Hannah. The mother of Shmuel, Samuel, the prophet. Nineteen and a half years she was barren. No children. She has a husband, Gdol Ador, the biggest Chacham, Navi, one of 48 prophets we had in history, is Elkanah. Her, her husband, Elkanah, holy man. She comes to him and says, do something, such holy man. I don't have kids. He has another wife, Pnina. She has kids. So he's, the problem is not by him. What does he answer her? I'm better for you than ten different kids. You have me, why do you need kids? More or less. You know, in Rosh Hashanah, all the readings in the Torah is about barren women. Hashem pakad et Sarah. Sarah was barren and now she became pregnant. We read it on Rosh Hashanah. And the Aftara about Hana. So the question is, why we read about the barren people? We read about Rachel, Hana, and Sarah. Three, ba three barren women. We read on Rosh Hashanah. Why? In the Amim Noraim. Why we read about them? Because those three barren women were counting on their holy husband to save them from their misery. Of course, they were counting also on Hashem. But because their husband was a holy man, their belief was split between Hashem and a human being, as righteous as it may be. Because of that, they didn't have kids. Because they were counting on a rabbi. Why? Rachel comes to Yaakov, Hava li banim ve'im ayin meta anochi. Give me children, if not, I'm gonna die, I'm dead. The Gemara says, from here you learn that someone who doesn't have kids count like a dead person. Because it's a verse in the book of God. If you're not gonna give me my own children, I'm dead. I better die. And Yaakov answer her, what do you want from me? I have kids with, with Leah. What, I'm the God? It's God's decision, not mine. Hannah comes to her husband, Elkanah, give me children. What does he say to her? What do you need children? I'm better for you than ten boys. Sarah comes to Abraham and says, listen, I cannot have kids. Take this Arab woman, Hagar, the Egyptian. Maybe you will have children with her. Instead of saying to her, God forbid, you will have your own children. Why are you sending me to this servant? Me and you will have kids. Avram, take Hagar and bring Ishmael to the world. How much we suffer because of that choice today. Everywhere you go, you suffer. The whole world. ישמעאל פרא אדם ידו בכל ויד כל בו. In a moment, those three women realized that their men will not do anything to take them out of their misery. They aim all their hope to Hashem. And that's when Hashem gave them a baby. That's why we read it in Rosh Hashanah. Achshav, you are together with Hashem, you don't need people, you don't need brokers. Now Hashem is going to decide what's going to happen to you this year. Don't lose hope. Now we have a story of Hanan, 19 and a half years, she's barren. She cries every day. The chief rabbi, his name is Eli. Eli in English. Eli from Bay Ridge. Eli is named after Eli, Holy Eli, and Eli the gangster. No. 
So Eli is a very holy man. He see that she cries like this, she already lose conscious from crying. She, he thought she's drunk. What, are you drinking? Why are you like this? No, I'm not drinking. I want a child. When she saw Hashem does not give her a child, she thought about a, a trick. A trick? Let me trick Hashem, supposedly. How will I trick Hashem? Ribono shel olam. If you're going to see, fine. If not, meaning if you're going to see my suffering and give me a child, fine. If you're not, I'm going to hide with another man in front of my husband, Elkanah, and my husband will be jealous, Mekaneli, and will take me to the Kohen to give me Mesota. And because I will not really cheat, I will only go into a room with him. So the Kohen, after that, will have to give me a blessing that I should have a child. So actually, she's threatening Hashem. It's your last chance. You either give me a child now, or I'm about to do a crazy thing now. I'm going to go and take another man in front of my husband. She doesn't say I'm going to take another man. She says I'm going to go and hide in front of my husband, Elkanah. Well, now we have to understand what's going on in this story. We have to, it doesn't add up. First, why she have to say Elkanah, my husband? We know who is Elkanah, and we know who is her husband. Why she has to say his name to Hashem? Hashem doesn't know who her husband is. Many times people that sponsor the lectures, sometimes they forget to say their name. Or the name of the person that they sponsor the lecture for, for health. But it's really no need to, sponsor, to mention any name. Why? Because in a minute you had in mind, I'm sponsoring that lecture for the memory of the soul of my father, or for the remedy of, of someone that is sick. That's it. Immediately it was noted in Shamaim. What, do you need to tell Hashem and remind him? No. But sometimes people say, no, no, but he didn't say the name. He said the name of the father, he should have said the name of the mother. No. Like Hashem doesn't know who we're talking here about. No. That's the way we are. So we have to understand why she said, Kana, my husband. Question number one. Remember the question. Rashi say, a satir, I'm going to hide im acherim, with others, plural. Ve'yachshedeni ba'ali, and my husband will suspect me. Why she say with others? Who we care who she's going to hide with? What's the nafkamina? What, what do we care? She hide with Ruven or Shimon or both of them? Three. Ve'yekanebi ve'yashkeni mei sota. My husband will be angry and jealous, and he's going to take me the coin and make me drink the water. Who gave Hana permission to force the Kohen to erase the name of God for nothing? She faked the scenario. What do you, it's so simple that you're allowed to erase the name of God. It's one of the worst sins in the Torah if someone erased the name of God. In Israel, one neighbor got a nice car, brand new car. The other neighbor was dying from jealousy. Usually when something like this happened, they come with a key and scratch the entire side, or the hood, making a 10,000 shekel damage. But this neighbor was afraid from Hashem, because that's causing a damage to another Jew. You're definitely going to come out of your pocket. Hashem's going to make you lose the damage. So he was afraid to lose the money, so he did not scratch the car, but he found a very creative way to force his neighbor not to use the brand new car. What did he do? He took sand, covered the entire hood of the car with sand, nicely smooth, and wrote the name of God, the letter Yud, the letter He, the letter Vav, and the letter He. Four letters on the sand. The neighbor gets up in the morning, he comes out. What? I had a blue car, how it became brown. He come closer, he see the name of God is written. Now he cannot drive it, because he will erase the name of God. 
He ran to the guy, he ran to the rabbi, rabbi, what should I do? The rabbi said, it's a problem. It's a problem, why? Why it's a problem? Because you have to wait until the wind will come and erase one of the four ladders. Once one of the four ladders will erase already, then you can drive it. Until then you cannot drive. The question is, if he would drive, what sin he would commit? The Oraita or the Rabbanan? Huh? What sin is going to be? From the Torah or rabbinical sin? The answer is rabbinical sin. Why? Because riding has to be permanent. If you write on Shabbat with the ink that evaporates after 30 seconds, you know this ink that they throw on your shirt and then it disappears? If you write a name on Shabbat with the ink that will not remain, this is a rabbinical sin, not the oraita. Why? Because writing has to remain for good. If you write two letters that will remain, where you wrote them on a wall, on a paper, on, 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 on material, anything that will remain, then it's a sin from the Torah. If they have no existence, meaning sooner or later, the, for instance, sometimes in the winter you have steam on the window, on the windshield of the car, steam, the kids write. On the, but that's in 10 minutes, anyway the sun is going to dry everything out. That's not a sin from the Torah. Why? Because this writing was never meant to stay. Same thing over here with the sand. It's not, it's not, not going to remain more than a day or two. It's not going to stay forever. It's sand. So to erase the name of God in such a scenario will not be the orator. It will be the rabbinical. But who's to say you're allowed to commit a rabbinical sin? Big problem. This... The poor neighbor was praying all day, Hashem, Mashiv Aruach, when he said in Shmona Yisrael, Umorid HaGeshem, hoping there's going to be rain. The rain will erase it. Either bring the wind, Mashiv Aruach, bring the wind, Ruach, Ruach is wind, Umorid HaGeshem. One way or the other, do something. <laughs> Few days later, Baruch Hashem was able to use his car. Do you see how jealous people act? But the neighbor won't enjoy his new car. I'm taking a bus and you're going to drive a new car? Lo yakum ve lo Top. So my husband is going to take me to the Kohen. Who, to, who told you the Kohen is allowed to write the name of Hashem and erase it in the water? Which is a sin the oraita, but Hashem permitted it to make peace between a husband and wife. How do you make a peace? The answer is... The husband doesn't want to be with her anymore. In his mind, she was intimate with another man. Can't look at her. The only way he will agree to get back with her is if he will know for sure that the water will prove that she didn't cheat. It's similar to a lie detector today. Some husband took their wife to a lie detector test or the other way around. Some people know how to fool the lie detector. It's not easy. You have to control your emotions, not to be stressed. There's ways to do it. The professional crooks, they already learn how to do it. But ordinary people, they get very nervous. If they ask them something and they know that they are guilty, immediately their poles and their temperature, everything changes in the body. Immediately they know right away. I don't even need lie detector. I see by the way the person behaves. Body language. That's what we spoke about last week. Body language. You see right away from a person when he's lying and when he's not. So, who told her that you're allowed to do an experiment and erase the name of God just because you want a child? After 19 and a half years of suffering, being a barren woman, you're going to take now such a risk and get Hashem upset by erasing the name, which is a sin against the Torah? The Gemara now begins. The Gemara say, according to the one that says, if she's barren, she's going to get kids. Who is this? Who is the, who is the one? There is machloket in the Gemara between Rabbi Ishmael and Rabbi Akiva. 
Rabbi Ishmael say, you don't have children, the Kohen will give you a blessing, you're going to have a child. Rabbi Akiva say, even if you have a child, the Kohen will give you a blessing. What is it? If your kids are too tall and you want them to be short, now you're going to get short. If they're short and you want tall, you get tall. If they're black and you want white, they come dark, lighter. If they're light and you want dark, they will become darker. If you give usually birth to one, you may get two now instead. So that's the opinion of Rabbi Akiva. It doesn't have to be a child, a child, meaning you're barren. Even a woman, a woman that has kids, she's still going to get something out of it. Rabbi Ishmael say, a barren woman, now she's going to have kids. So the Gemara say, what does it mean if you're going to see, fine, if not, if you're not going to see, I'm going to hide. According to Rabbi Akiva, we don't understand. Even according to him, if a woman gives birth with pain, now the pain will go away. If she gives birth to an ugly kid, now she's going to get a much better kid. So even according to him, she has what to gain. So according to both opinions, she will gain. The Maharil Diskin say, Chana, Chana, Chana was thinking, if my husband will tell me, don't go out with this guy, right? That's when she's going to get a child. But if she does it as a trick, who's to say that Hashem would cooperate with this, that the blessing will work? Chana said to Hashem, if you're not going to give me a child, people would say that the Torah is not true. Because here you go. You took me to the Kohen, I drank the water, and I didn't get a child. So no, no one would believe in your Torah. If you think that you're not going to give me a child because I tricked you, right? Everyone see that I drank the water and I didn't die. I'm going to do it. People may think that maybe my husband is also a cheater. That's why I didn't die. It doesn't mean I'm clean. No, not in my case, because my husband is Elkanah. No one would suspect a prophet that you speak to and he goes with other women. So in my case, everyone will know that my husband is clean. And if I drank the water and didn't get a child, they will complain against your Torah. Meaning she's trying to force Hashem to surrender to her. Look, in a, in a very clever argument. And... My husband has to tell me not to go with someone, but there's a problem. Who will dare to isolate himself with the wife of a prophet? From all the people in the world, you chose the biggest rabbit scent to go and, uh, and isolate yourself with her? Who is going to dare to do such thing? There's no customers. Everyone, I'm going to come, come, come. I need to talk to you in the room. Lock the door. Right away with run. Rabbit scent. What are you doing? And run right away. Even those who are cheaters, they will not dare to be on a spot like this. So, we have the opinion of the Rambam. The Rambam say it doesn't have to be one man. It can be two or three even. It can be a group. If she's isolated herself with a group of guys, let's say they're in a room, they're talking, they're not afraid because they're watching each other. No one will, will do something in front of his friends. Especially not with the Holy Rabbit's in. So she's going to go in and her husband will tell her, I don't want you near this guy Reuven. But there are a few guys over there. According to the Rambam, that's enough for him to take her to the Kohen. Even there were a few guys over there. But the public, the public, is going to fool the public because here I'm going to the Kohen because my husband told me how did someone agree to be with me? No one did, really. My husband just don't like this guy. He's suspecting him. So now she thought about everything. Tov. The Khatam Sufer, 200 years ago in Hungary. Even Aezer Chelek Bet, Shuva Kuf Bet, 102. It says... According to the Rambam, it can be two or three. It doesn't have to be one. Therefore, the question is, who is going to dare to be with her alone? It's not relevant anymore. It could be a group of people, and the group of people not afraid to be with her alone, 
Because they have witnesses that they didn't do anything. They're three guys. Okay. What happened in the end? She got a, a boy, Shmuel, equal like Moshe and Aaron combined. And uh, this is a boy that came with 19 and a half years of prayers. Last thing in the parasha is Birkat Kohanim. Hashem said to the Kohanim, children of Aaron, Aaron, a Kohen, I want you to bless the nation of Israel. In Israel, everyone do Birkat Kohanim, all the Kohanim, Sfaradi, Ashkenazim, everyone in the Holy Land. Here in exile, only Sfaradim do Birkat Kohanim daily. The Ashkenazim don't do Birkat Kohanim. Only on the three festivals, on the holidays. Not only on Shabbat, every day. Sfaradim every day in the Davini. The Ashkenazim only three times a year in exile. In Israel every day, like Sfaradim. You ask the Ashkenazim, why don't you do Birkat Kohanim in America or in Europe? They say because the Kohen has to be in happiness when he blessed. If he's disturbed or upset or sad, when you said you cannot have the spirit of Hashem on you, so you cannot pass a blessing of God to others. And why in America you are upset and in Israel you're happy? Because you live in exile. Today, by the way, is the other way around. Take a hundred Kohanim from Israel, do a survey. See how angry they are and uptight and struggle and this, with the uptight pressure of life. See the Kohanim here in Great Neck, in Deal. Coming with a nice Bentley. Another million went to the account. Very, very, you know, very relaxed. <laughs> Seder, that's because we are so low today that we only care about materialism. That's the first thing in life. Money, money, money. Then we worry about other things. It wasn't like that back then. Back then people lived in the Holy Land walking in the streets of, of Jerusalem or anywhere, they are in a moon. I live in the house of God. Who wants to be in exile? It's a curse. So anyway, by the way, some big Ashkenazim rabbis, when they come to America, they make sure to come to pray by Sfaradim because they don't want to miss one day in their life of Birkat Kohanim. Rav Aaron Lev Steineman Zatzal, that's, a, that's the way it was. He used to come to Daven by us in Yeshiva in Monsi. Why are you coming here, Rabbi? He's Ashkenazi, 100 years old. Not to miss Birkat Kohanim. The question is, what is the blessing of Birkat Kohanim? Yevarechecha Hashem veishmerecha, Yair Adonai panav elecha veichuneka, Isa Adonai panav elecha veyasem lecha shalom. What's the meaning of the words? Yevarechecha Hashem veishmerecha, Hashem will bless you, and keep you, right? Yair Hashem panav elecha v'yichuneka Hashem would light his face to you and yichuneka will have mercy on you, yichun otcha Yisa Hashem panav elecha v'yasem lecha shalom Hashem will favorite you from other nations and will give you peace, peace and peace of mind. What's the continuation of the verse? וסמו את שמי על בני ישראל, and they put my name on the nation of Israel, ואני אברכם, and I will bless them. I would like to start from the end. What does it mean, ואני אברכם, and I will bless them? I will bless who? I will bless the Jewish nation, or I will bless the Kohanim? Huh? We have to ask a question, the Kohen. Okay, I'm going to bless the nation of Israel every day, but who's going to bless me? I'm deprived. So Hashem say, you make sure to bless the Jewish nation with happiness. You make sure to put my name on them every day. And I will bless you, don't worry. You're not going to lose from it. 
זה ברכת כהנים. דה כהנים, דה ביג מקובל אנד קמנטרי און התורה, רבנו בחיה, בן אשר, אומוסט א תאוזן ירס אגו. He talks about the words of Chazal in Baba Kama 110. The Kohanim got 24 gifts, parts from the sacrifices, first fruits, the, the 10%, the wheat, the barley, all these things. Chala, piece from the door. They get the skins, all kinds of things. They get 24 gifts. And they have one more gift, to bless the Jewish nation in these three verses. That's the 25th gift of the Kohanim, that they have this ability. And this is the word, Ko Tevarchu Et Bnei Israel. Ko. Ko, Chaf, it's 20, hey, it's 5. 25. Because of you blessing the Jewish nation, I paid you big time. 25 gifts I gave you for that. There was a, a person, a big rabbi, his name Rab, Rabbi Akiva HaKohen. He was the president of the community in a city called Oifin, some Ashkenazi city in Europe. He had 12 kids, sons, all Kohanim, and 12 daughters, 24 <laughs> kids he had. All his daughters marry Kohanim. Did you ever hear such a story? You have 12 sons, all of them Kohanim. And you have 12 daughters, they all marry Kohanim. So you have 21, 24, 24 Kohanim in the house. 12 of your sons and 12 of your Chatanim. Together with him, it was 25 Kohanim. And he used to say, Ko tevarchu et bnei Yisrael. 25. Ko. That's this pasuk in the Torah is about me. You know, in Masechet Megillah, chapter 4, when we go up to the Torah Monday and Thursday every week, three people go up to the Torah. In Yom Tov, five people go up to the Torah. On Shabbat, seven people go up to the Torah. We get a hint to it in the verses. The first three verses of Birkat Chohanim. Yevarechecha, right? Hashem veishmerecha. How many words? Three. That's for Monday and Thursday. Three people go up to the Torah. Yair Hashem pana velecha veichuneka. Five people. When? Yom Tov. Five people go up to the Torah. Yisa Hashem pana velecha veyasem lecha shalom, seven words for Shabbat. The Aliyot. Three, five, and seven. Yevarechecha, three, first pasuk, three words, second verse, five words, third words, seven. Together, the minyan of the aliyot that people go up to the Torah. Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel, we'll finish here, Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel say, כל המשים שלום בתוך ביתו, מעלה עליו הכתוב, כאילו משים שלום בישראל על כל אחד ואחד. Everyone who make peace in his house, it's count in the eyes of Hashem that he make peace in the entire nation of Israel. And everyone who makes problems and fights and jealousy and competition in his house, it count like he did it for the entire nation of Israel. Bet Shammai and Bet Hillel, they were arguing about many subjects of the Torah, contradicting each other in halacha. But they still marry each other, even though they had opposite opinions, what's allowed, what's not allowed. They still marry each other. And they live in love and peace. 
And that's what I want to finish the lecture today, that it's one of the saddest things that we actually lost that dignity. Today all the arguments come from ego. I want to be right. The truth does not concern me. I argue for the sake of winning, to put my friend down, to be the winner, to be the smarter. That's all politicians like this, pure garbage. The last thing they care about is the safety of Israel or what's good for the land. They only want their chair, their salary, control and honor. That's why they're willing to give billions to Arab terrorists who declare they won't rest until they slaughter us all. And when the Arab threatened them that they want to break the coalition, immediately they called them, take another billion, be quiet. They don't care. Take the whole money of Israel and give it to the terrorists. Why? Well, I sit on my leather couch and prime minister, I'm the prime minister. They don't care. When two religious people argue in yeshiva, do they argue because they're zealous to what Hashem really meant? I wish. I hope I'm wrong. That's the way it should be. Why are you arguing with your chevruta? Because you are anxious to know the truth. But if you hear that your friend makes more sense than you, why you continue to waste time? It's bitul Torah. You're going to be punished for wasting time, 15 minutes for his ego. I remember when I started to learn, after a year or two, I had a chassid chevruta, gingy, red hair, red beard, red hair, zealous, fire. I used to drive him crazy with my horrible midot. He was jumping like this in yeshiva. I went crazy. I look back 25 years now and I'm so ashamed. Sometimes I see him in Monsi, I run away. How many hours I wasted of the life of this tzaddik Hasid? Why? I wanted to show him that even though I'm only two years in learning and he's 20 years in learning or 15, whatever it was, I'm not less than you. It takes years until you make yourself a human being. What do you think? come from a secular world, everyone there is in a competition, show off, ego, I'm the greatest, I'm the smartest, real low life. And then after a few years you begin to learn and learn and learn and you start to improve. And then one day you look back at how you used to be and you don't know where to hide, you're ashamed. You're ashamed. You look at the pictures of the day of your wedding in the album, you want to cry. Immediately you dump the album to the garbage. Why? God forbid that my children won't see how I looked. Just a week ago we lost the greatest Baal Tshuva of the generation, Rabbi Uri Zohar. From the lowest man on earth, he became the greatest man on earth. This only happened last time in the history, in the time of Rabbi Akiva. Since Rabbi Akiva, he didn't have anyone like Rav Uri Zohar, 2,000 years. From the lowest point, women, drugs, movies, walking naked on a beach of Tel Aviv, wild hair, drugs, Hollywood, jokes, vulgarity, cursing, talk show, cursing on the radio, impacting the life of thousands every minute. From the lowest hall into the highest mountain. He left and kicked completely the fake life. The movies, he gave up his rights to the movies, didn't want to take the money, begged them, let me pay you to buy the rights so I should destroy those movies. He had a mansion on Jaffa on the beach. It's probably four or five million dollars today. He gave it up. He lived in a storage, one tiny room, size of a bathroom here. Size of a bathroom here. With the Gemara open for 40 years. Convinced tens of thousands of children to move from public school to yeshivot. That was his job, for Lev Leachim. Do you know how many children were secular like Goim? And thanks to him, 
Because a lot of secular parents admired him as a movie star. And he was talking on the radio and in other places. And convincing parents to move their children to yeshivot. So that's the Baal Tshuva of the generation. If somebody asks you, who is the biggest Baal Tshuva in, in ever? From the time of Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva was similar. Hated rabbis, was an alphabet, age four, didn't know anything from his life, doesn't know how to read and write. And Rabbi Akiva started age 40, just like Uri Zohar. And he passed now 86. Rabbi Akiva made it to 120. Some say Rabbi Akiva came back in Gilgul of the Ramchal. That lived 39 years, and in the 48 years he passed to complete the 40 missing years. And apparently, it's very interesting, the Ramchal is buried next to Rabbi Akiva in Tiberia. Next, the same site, Rabbi Akiva, Ramchal. Unbelievable, same soul, two bodies. Rambam is there in Tveria, a lot of tzadikim. That we also become serious, Ba'alet Shuva. Most important thing, fix the terrible traits, midot, modesty, dignity, devotion, holiness, get rid of the ego, get rid of the anger, get rid of all the negative things, the laziness, all the fake show of lifestyle. And remember, very hard days are coming. Prepare mentally. Prepare. Now it's more time to read Tehili, more time to learn Torah, more time to fix things because there's Midat Adin in the world right now. Judgment everywhere. I don't have to tell you that every time something like this happened, the ones that paid the biggest price are the Jews. Check the entire history. When the Goyim don't have what to eat, and I cannot afford anymore the nice house and the pool and the vacation and whatever they like to, to do. And they see some rich Jews still in the banks and doctors and some people who still make money. It drives them crazy. There's nothing you can do about it. Of course, not all Goim are like that, but it's enough that 10, 20 percent are like that. It's, it's a billion people in the world. So you gotta be extra careful. Do not do bad things. Don't do Chilul Hashem. Don't dress too fancy. Don't walk with expensive jewelry and watches. Trying to lower the profile. Don't argue with people in public. People see that you're Jewish. Drives them extra crazy. If a guy argue, no, no. They get them a little angry. A Jew, especially religious one, argue with another guy. Drives them crazy. Lower your profile. Let go. Don't complain when you go to a restaurant, the waiter is a goy, don't drive him crazy. You have to pay attention, Rabotai, I'm giving you advices for every day now. You gotta be extremely careful. Why? There is gas leaking now. All you need is one match and everything will explode. So we have to do the best we can. Now we, all, we hope to survive. It's no joke. Remember what's going to happen now. There are people who are paying mortgages on mansions of five, six, seven million, and those houses will go down to two million. They're going to pay on seven million house when the house, they already know the house doesn't even worth a third in a year from now. Think about it. It's going to be a lot of people like this. All kinds of things will happen. Don't know what can happen. Because of that, we have to now extra cry to Hashem. And I give you the best advice. Soon or later, we're all going to leave the world with pain, without pain, suffering, not suffering. We are here just for one reason, to prepare our place in the next world. Remember this. So now, before we're going to lose all our money anyway, if God forbid that's the decree, now it's the time to give a lot to tzedakah, to save more souls. Why? Because this kind of money you take with you. Nobody can take it away from you. What you invested in holy causes, nobody can take it away from you. What you kept and the bank took it or the government took it or some robber robbed you, that's it. You lost it. You're not getting a reward for it. So now 
Because before, when you see that the boat is drowning and soon your money is gonna be he is gonna be all going down and you see another boat next to you, at least throw the money to them. Before the money is gonna go down the, to the to the ocean. At least somebody else will enjoy it. If you could throw it to someone else and get a thousand times more later on in return, you wouldn't do it. What you would take it down with you to the water? You have to be clever. Because in the end, we will die one way or the other. The question is, what are we going to take in our bag with us to the next world? And the only thing you take is investments in Torah, in guys that sit and learn Torah, in saving souls, publishing Torah, videos, promoting, showing the truth to more people. Because it's going to be financial struggle in next year now, that's a chance to save many more souls. Remember, when people are, are fat and rich, they don't have patience to even listen to five minutes of the rabbi's word. <laughs> Who is this poor rabbi preaching to me what's good and what's not? I'm a, a head of a big uh, franchise. But when he's losing millions of dollars every month, and he's depressed and his ego is down to the, to the drain, believe me. The rabbi is going to go back to power. Why? Because when people are desperate and they're depressed and they're upset and they're sad and they're broken, they are open for a rebuke, for Musar. In a funeral, a lot of people think about becoming religious. In a party, no one thinks about becoming religious. In a funeral and in a hospital, people think to become religious. Why? Because it breaks the heart takes away all the desire and the materialism. Take it away. For five minutes, for an hour. That moment you can see the eyes with a clear, with a, they see the world with a clear eyes, like the Chazuni say. Free from the cord of materialism. For one hour you begin to see what's really real. And the Gemara told you, Torah and Gmilut Hasadim. Torah and kindness. And there's no bigger kindness than saving souls and rebuking people and bring them back to Hashem. There's no, nothing comes near it. That the boy of the king is drowning and you saved him. And now the king is your best friend forever. You brought Hashem back his children from the death, from a spiritual death. He will never forget it for you. Only in this you should invest. Why? That's going to save you. Remember, in the next world, remember what I say. If you won't do it, you will never forgive yourself that you could have done it. You didn't do it. You have nothing to cash out on in the next world. And in the end, you lost the money. That's the worst feeling. I hate it. I could have done it. When you lose the money, the Satan that convinced you to keep the money until you lost it, the same Satan come and say, at least you should have given it to the yeshiva. At least you should have given it to Rabbi Mizrahi who make another five films and make another 5,000 bala tshuva. Such a shame. How many times he begged people to help and nobody wanted to help. And then you're thinking, Chaval, I could have helped. At least I would have another 10,000 bala tshuva in my pocket. Now I have no bala tshuva and no money and no life. Well, this, this, is a, this is not my opinion here, what I'm telling you. It's written in every chapter in the in Talmud, in the Gemara. Everywhere in the Chumash, in the Zohar. The Zohar in Parashat Truma say that someone that thanks to him, souls coming back to Hashem, is greater than all the prophets in the next world. Greater than the prophets in the eyes of Hashem. Do you, know, you understand what I'm saying here? Some ordinary Jew that gave a few million dollars to save souls. That's it. It was regular, religious, nothing special. Nothing special. But he gave a few million dollars to save souls. He comes to the next world, they treat him like Yirmiya, Yeshaya, Amos, Haggai, all the Nevi'im. Better. It's written in Chovat Alevavot also. It's greater than the Nevi'im Ashlemim. It's written. You know what it is? It's a nuclear bomb what I just dropped. You're going to come to Shamaim, your ordinary Jew from Brooklyn or from anywhere else. And they're going to say, welcome this special Jew. What? I'm special? 
וואלה well, מה היה, I'm a real estate guy, I'm a diamond dealer, I'm a mechanic, what am I? Come, then they show you 10,000 people, all of them, Bnei Torah, how they make Hashem happy. He said, this is all your children. My children? Barely had two kids and two dogs. <laughs> Who are all these people? <laughs> you got me, <laughs> I'm not the guy. I mean, I wish I had all these guys. Who are my children, but I have nothing to do with them. No, no. They are all religious thanks to you. And they show you how the money travels. How the CD was done, and he went to him, and how he watched it, and how he became religious, and how he had five kids. And then 20 years later, they have already 20 ch grandchildren. And now you, you see like a spy, spider web. Spider web. And you see how your money was spread all over the universe and making so many people going back to Hashem. Someone from Georgia, Tbilisi, Georgia, sent me today an email. Him and his wife watched the film one time. Changed their entire life two years ago. Two years ago. Another two, from one film. Now they're strictly religious. Today I got a lot of emails. Today was, in a, usually I get around 20 a day. Today I, I just, they, I just, just work, keep coming. Keep coming, why? Maybe people feel now, they see what's happening in the world, they realize to write an email and tell how they became Baalei Tshuva. Bezrat Hashem, we're working now on, uh, on that film in English, Shabbat in English. The one in Hebrew, we did. Now we're doing the one in, in, uh, in English. It's a very good investment to make that film one hour. Everyone will watch it. We'll have no choice but to become Shomer Shabbat. I want to remind you what I say for those who came late. You can receive now CDs for free. Which one? CD number one with all the proofs and Shabbat and, uh, and the laws of repentance and free choice. There's a lot of important lecture on CD number one. That's for beginners. Also, Pat to the Jazz series and the Pirkei Avot series. Those three CDs, you can get them unlimited for free. All you have to do is either pay for the shipping or come to one of the lectures and pick it up. You have to tell me in advance, Rabbi Mizrahi at gmail.com that you're gonna come Monday or Tuesday or to other lectures that I give in advance and I'll bring you a box for how many of you committed to give out. Let's do something with the leftover CDs. Soon there's not gonna be CDs anymore after you're gonna throw all of them to the garbage. So please take advantage on it, what do you care? It's not gonna cost you, you come, you pick it up, you give them out, you put a little bit here, a little bit there, people take, they watch it in a car, in a house, in a laptop, I don't know. And it makes, it can save more people. Instead of this CD eventually goes to the garbage, let's save another few thousand people. Why not? It's on the way. Take advantage of it. Baruch Adonai Le'olam, Amen ve'amen. Rabbi Hananiah ben Akashiah.